Good morning. All right. So, um, Pastor asked me to, to preach last week because of Robbie's wedding. Um, that's why he's not here. And I, I guess it went well because when, when Rob inadvertently butt dialed me um, during the reception, uh, it sounded like everyone was having a, a pretty nice time. And I guess dinner was good. Um, and yes, that did happen. Uh, anyway, I, I, of course, I, I said yes, and because, you know, I like to help out every now and then. The question uh, when this comes up, though, is what do I preach about? Um, as I said, last time I preached, I can't really do expository preaching like Rob did. You know, it's funny how ingrained that has become, I think, in a lot of us now. Like when my kids went away to college, well, one went to college, went up to live, live with his grandparents to, to work in Harrisburg. Um, so they left at nearly the same time right when my, my dog died. And so uh, becoming an, an empty nester is hard enough when you're ready for it. But when it happens and you didn't know it was going to happen, um, that's how you end up with a puppy. Anyway, <laughs> when my kids left, they, they were having trouble finding churches to attend because they, quote, do it wrong. They don't work from the beginning of one book until it's, it's finished. So with that kind of um, pervasive mindset in, in the church, I find I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. But then I thought, well, well Rob seems to only preach like every in, in two-week spurts. So, so maybe I can do some expository preaching. By the way, that's a joke. Rob and I rib on each other. So anyway. Um, I just won't do a, a long book. I'll try expository, but not a long one, because if I did like Isaiah or something, it'd be like 50 years, and I'm probably not going to be around that long. So uh, if you'd like to turn in your copy of the Word to 2 John, we're going to give this expository stuff a shot. Now, if you're doing that flip technique, you might miss it. Um, I've titled this sermon, Love Gone Wrong, which they didn't put on that because I titled it that this morning. Um, John, you may know, the pastor, not the pastor John, um, the, the apostle John, is sometimes referred to as the apostle of love because of his extensive use of that word in the word, capital W. Uh, and that word does seem to tie together at least the first three of his canonical letters. John, 1 John, and 2 John. But he might more accurately be called the apostle of truth. Because that word appears prevalently in all of his letters. Or possibly he could be called the apostle of obedience. Because that word and forms of that word um, show up as well. But I'm, I'm not here to nitpick of which. Or am I? That might be exactly why I'm here. Let's pray. Father God, um, I just... Uh, Again, just want to want to praise your name. We look to you this morning and to your word uh, that that in it we would find you, that we would we would find ourselves in you and experience your glory as we look upon it and on your name. We do this to draw draw closer to you, God, that we might honor you more through our application of, of what we hear from you here in this place on this morning that you've provided for us. Spirit, we, we ask you to open our ears and, and open our spirits to your teaching this morning. And as always, I personally pray to hear only you this morning through this message, through the message you've provided. It's in Jesus' most holy name that we pray. Amen. So let's start by first delving into the word and seeing what it holds for us. Would anyone like to read from... I'm sorry, I'm usually in kids' church. Um, I'll read. Um, let's start from verse 1, because that's generally a good place to start. My clicker's not working. Laser works. I won't blind any of you. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth, which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, 
just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you face to face. That's how it's supposed to be done. Okay. A couple of things jumped out at me. Maybe they jumped out at you too. Now, I wanted to show off and I typed in Greek. But it didn't show up in Greek. So that thing at the beginning looked really cool on my screen. That's a side note. First thing that jumped out at me was how often he wrote the word agapeo, or love. Anyone else notice the prevalent use of the word love from the apostle of love? He used that word four times. It seemed like a lot more, but it was only four. I'll come back and I'll, I'll discuss the significance of that in a minute, but I want to introduce the, the other words that kind of out to me. The next is aletheia, truth. He uses that five times. Next, I'm going to include two different Greek words together because they're sort of antonyms or opposites, but they mean the same thing. I'm going to have to explain that, aren't I? Yeah, okay. Well, I will. The first is meno, and the second is peripateo. They mean abides and walking about, respectively, each of which he uses three times. So he matches them up. Abides, stay put where you are, walking around, not staying put where you are. They mean the same thing. Okay? Finally, the word, and yay, finally, the word, I can't pronounce it over there, um, entele, which means commandment. He used that word commandment four times. And then for real, finally, I kind of got your hopes up that last time, um, RK. It's only used twice, but it means beginning. And this is John we're talking about here. So that kind of triggered something in me, mainly because, again, it's John. And so I want to start with that. I want to start with that word, beginning. Oh, great. He's 20 minutes in, and he's starting. OK. So verse zis, plural, 5 and 6. They both contain the phrase, <coughs> not that, from the beginning. And when I read this, it immediately took me back to John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. We also find a similar construction in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the Word of life. What was from the beginning. Jesus is located, if you will, located, in or since the beginning in John. And here in John, in 2 John, the commandment emanates from the beginning. Now when I say beginning, what do we naturally think of? We think of time. Sure. But that's not always the case. Let's go back to the Old Testament. 
Isaiah 41, 4, who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth to generations from the beginning, I, the Lord, am the first. And with the last, I am he. Isaiah 44, 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am, name of God, the last, and there is no God beside, beside me. Isaiah 48, 12, listen to me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called, I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. I find a few things interesting here. In Isaiah 41, 4, the Lord is, is the first and is with the last. In 48.12, he says that he is the first, but he is also the last. And in, in, in 44.6, he says, I am the first and I am the last, no comma before the and. Even though we have there the joining of two independent clauses, each with its own subject, verb, and predicate nominative, essentially it'd be a predicate adjective, but in this case it's not describing, it's renaming, modifying. Is that too nerdy? Okay. No. Yeah. All right, we'll move on. I think we'll move on. In John 17, 5. Where's the, there's the magic spot. John 17, 5 places Jesus prior to the invention of time. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus was in the beginning, but this is before what we would normally think of the beginning. It removes time as the sole meaning of this word, beginning. And he then places himself with God in this beginning. And then he clearly extends the word to himself repeatedly in his revelation to John. First, he uses the terms alpha and omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I am the alpha and the omega, says the Lord God. But then he calls himself the first and the last. In the next verse, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, now equating it to that. To make sure we don't miss it, at the end of Revelation, he equates alpha and omega with beginning and the end. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to one who thirsts the spring of the water and without cost. And finally, in Revelation twenty two thirteen, 13, he puts all of them together. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the first. I am the beginning. Jesus here isn't just from the beginning. He is the beginning. Like another name. And in 2 John, the commandment comes from the beginning, which is with God and which is God. Get it? Do I have to clarify that? The beginning is God. It comes from him. It comes from Jesus. Now, rapid fire, I'm going to cover all the other words I threw at you at once, primarily because they're, they're mixed in. Um, and I'm primarily going to use the writings of John because I want to solidify the point of 2 John. And by the way, yes, there is going to be a point. Okay, rest assured. Um, I just, I love Christmas. And you know, like when all the gifts are wrapped and they might be sitting there for a while and you don't, you don't know what you had. And, and I always hated when, when I somehow got tipped off, you know, to what I was going to get by my brother just blatantly telling me what I was getting because he wanted me to tell him, which I wouldn't. See, I like I liked the surprise. So think of it that way. When we get to the end of this, it'll be like Christmas. Okay. So anyway. So first, the commandment that we have. And I'm blind in this eye, so I tend to turn that way. Sorry, I'm trying. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. Nah, find my spot. There we go. John 2 says that this isn't a new commandment. Verse 34 a new commandment I give to you. 
Is that a contradiction? Is this one of those places where the Bible contradicts itself? John said it's not a new commandment. He just said, he just said it is. The commandment is old and the commandment is new. And just like the staying put and walking around part, they mean the same thing. I'll explain. But for now, the commandment is to love one another so others would know they were disciples. That's kind of new because the great commandment we should all be familiar with, the great commandment of Mark, I know it's small. If you're going to take notes, just put the note reference and we'll get to it. Okay. In Mark 12, 28, we get the commandment. Verse 30, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. All of the other commandments in the Old Testament rely on those. Uh, Matthew gives us the same story in verses uh, 34 and 36 of, of chapter 22. Uh, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said, you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. It's great in first commandment. Second is like it. You'll love your neighbor as yourself. On those two laws depend the law and the prophets. Okay. They were just told to love everybody, disciple or not. But now it was this love for each other that would show the world that they were somehow different. Remember that. That's how I underline. Also, in every verse I'm about to show you, I just want to stress that, that the word used for love is that agapeo uh, word. Now, the Greeks had four words for love to designate different types of love, but um, throughout all of these, they're going to be using the same one, and it's that unconditional um, sacrificing love that we're thinking of here. So, okay, I think it's time for the abide continue quandary. I'll, I'll do that now. The word translated abide means variably. Uh, to abide in, or to dwell, to lodge, or to sojourn. And that's the first two year uses in, in 2 John. But if you go to verse 9, where it's used twice, it's translated continue. So abide in is translated as continue, because the word also means to continue unchanged, or steadfast, or to remain. So the word translated walking means to walk about row of Rome, but it also means to frequent, as in a locality. And if you look at verse 4, that locality is the truth, which we're going to come back to that word. So it, it also means to maintain a certain, quote, walk of life or a certain conduct. So one stays in, abides in the truth by walking about in the truth. So even though they're opposites, it's the same thing. Okay? It's not just while I'm here, it's also while I'm walking about. Okay? Got that? Different but the same? Okay. Everyone with me? Next one. To produce fruit, really small, that's okay, just get the thing. Um, and I am going to go really fast. Uh, to produce fruit, one must abide in the Lord, which is an act of love for the Father and for the Son and for one another, in which we are commanded to do as he did and does for us. By the way, to love the Father is to love the Son. Jesus and the Father are one. But how do we love like the Father and the Son? How do we love like him? I command you that you love one another at the end. How do we do it like him? I memorized that before I was a Christian because when I watched football games and they kicked field goals or someone was holding up a sign that had that on it. Like every game while I was growing up. So I remember that. That is how you do this. The father and the son modeled how to love one another. And remember, the Father and the Son are one. For this is how God loved the, word, the world. I use the NLT here because I think it's a little bit more clear for the meaning of the Greek. Most of us memorize, for God so loved the world, and we think that it's a quant, like, a, like a quality of it. It's like, oh, this, or quantity of it, that it's like, oh, he loved us so much. The word much isn't there. It doesn't mean 
how much he loves us. It means how he loved us. This is how he loved us, because he sent his son for all of us while we were still sinners. And again, the father and the son are one. God killed God on the cross. The judge took off his robe and stepped down to take the punishment. Okay? That's how you love one another. We carry each other's burdens. It's hard to wrap your brain around sometimes, but that's because God's bigger than any of us. But the great thing is we have eternity future to try to figure it out, and we still never will. We start to get more into this as we look at the, at the next few verses. Um, we're bombarded with this concept of, of abiding in him and he in us, of obeying his commands, of loving him, of loving each other. But you also start to see what is really the point of this message. Look at verse 24 here. I have a laser pointer, but it doesn't show up. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Not only does he identify here who, the, those who do love him, he shows us who does not love him. He takes it one step further in verse 30. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has nothing in me. The ruler of this world. He has nothing that abides in Christ. So I ask, is the world evil if it has nothing that abides in Christ? If the ruler is, I think it's kind of clear. You see, if we keep his commandments, verse 3, we love him. If we don't, we don't. This is that old uh, WWJD bracelet. You remember those things? People wearing around. You know, remember the, you know, what would Jesus do? They need updated. Um, it isn't what would he do. It should be what did he do. And what he did, if we love him, is what we should be doing. And this is the old yet the new command. Remember, he is the beginning, but he's also the now. He was the old covenant, but he is the new covenant with the blood. We were always commanded to love. The entire Mosaic law hinges upon love. But with the advent of Christ, there's a new situation in which that love is now to occur. The blood of Christ has come, the sacrifice is made, and the sacrifice was by God. Note, I am writing a new commandment. Verse 8. I am, name of God, writing a new commandment to you. So he said it's an old commandment, but it's also a new commandment. And so now the point. Okay, good. Now the point. Well, almost. What happens when we do not love? What happens when we don't abide in him? What happens when we don't hear his voice and obey his commands? We are created to love, and we're going to love something. And if we're not loving him, we're going to love the world, and we're going to begin to elevate ourselves, just as the ruler of this world had done and got him booted. If you love the world, you go the way of the world. You abide in the world. You follow the commands of the world and the ruler of the world. And this world... Is passing away. Sometimes the word can be painfully blunt. Did it advance? Yes, good. 
The love of others and the love of practicing righteousness is equal to the love of God, kind of. It's equated to it. God didn't accept Cain's sacrifices, but he did accept Abel's. Ever wondered about that? What was so wrong with, with, with Cain's sacri sacrifice? I've been asked, why? Was it because it was grain? Because he wasn't, wasn't killing sheep or something? I mean, there are, there, look through Leviticus and, and Exodus. There's grain offerings all over the place. Was it grain? No, it's not grain. It's because in his heart, Cain was a murderer. He hadn't done it yet, but this is God. God knew Cain was already a, a, a murderer, murderfier. We can't see it because we aren't God, who can see the heart and who knew that Cain's sacrifices were false. 1 John 4, 7 to 12. I know it goes to 14, but beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Key. But this, the love of God, was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. His love becomes perfect in us. Again, loving is abiding Further, also in John. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The world wants you to think they're burdensome. They're not. I don't really struggle with killing people anymore. But it's, it's, you know, there, there, there are struggles in the other things, but it doesn't, it doesn't hold us back. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. They're to help us overcome the world. It's the battle plan to overcome the world. It's not a burden. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Our faith is that victory. Brothers and sisters, I have to ask you, are you struggling to love someone? You shouldn't be. If you have Christ... It should be natural to love others. I don't care if you like everyone. There's no commandment in the Bible to like your neighbor. But we are commanded to love them. And now, for the actual point. That was all just groundwork. Yeah. Oh, you're almost done. Yep, I am almost done, actually. I want to look again at 2 John, since that was kind of the whole point of this. Uh, verses 7 to 11. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching... He has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Do not give him a greeting. The one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deed. So, we see here that it's not just the ruler going out into the world to deceive the world. Oh, the devil made me do it. No. There's a lot of other deceivers out there. Sometimes we deceive ourselves. The Antichrist is positively identified here as either an atheist that claims that Jesus never existed or a proponent of some Gnostic-type belief that Jesus only appeared like he had a human body, but it really wasn't. And yes, there are several cults out there that still teach that. It could be, and forgive me, um, but this is the only way in the only word 
that fits this idea. It could be the stupid assertion that Jesus was just a good teacher, but not God in the flesh. He claimed to be God in the flesh. He's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's who he says he was. And I'm not listening to a liar, and I'm not listening to a lunatic. So if he's not God in the flesh, then this should just go in the trash. I think we can see that those who deny Christ are not in Christ, but I want to pay close attention to this verse. I really struggled with this verse, and I put up two versions of it here for two, two translations of the, uh, the bold-faced part there. It goes too far, goes on ahead. That didn't really make sense to me. And I went and looked at the Greek, uh, proago, it means to conduct forth or produce or to go before, to go first, to precede. Not proceed, precede. To be in advance of. And I was like, go, goes on ahead of what? Is this a reference maybe to backsliding, of, of, of going back to the way you were before you knew Christ, I can kind of see that in these verses, um, but in the context of the rest of the section, that doesn't 100% make sense. And so I, I, I don't think, at least not fully, that that's what it's saying. Verse 10 says that if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, another question, what teaching? Well, by rule of proximity, the teaching of verse 9 that anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. So, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Now, the word translated partici participates in carries the meaning of to be implicated in, to be party to. In other words, you're in on whatever that sin is. You're in the getaway car when it's pulled over there, Bugsy. You're in on it. You may not have gone in the bank, but you're in the getaway car. You're guilty. I think the NASB has it right. The danger from atheists the da and, and all of those, that's, that's obvious. But what about the danger of a deceiver who takes the teaching too far? John is the apostle of love. But I think we see here what that love is, what John's been expressing it to be. It's a sacrificial love of obedience to God and his character as manifested in his son, Jesus Christ. And I think we see that too far mentality in our world today. The idea that love conquers all has been applied to areas that it dare not be applied Yes, love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4, 8, but it doesn't excuse any of those sins. Turning a blind eye to want and self-destruction is not love, and guiding someone away from the flames is not hatred and is not intolerance. If it is, then Jesus was the most hateful and intolerant person who ever lived because he says clearly, clearly in Revelation 21, 8, that the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death, which wasn't even created for us. It was created for Satan and for death, and they were going to be thrown in it, but we can go there by our own choice, and it is our choice. We need to bravely, not cowardly, we need to bravely stand against the ways that seem right to the world and not to receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. The word translated house also is used in scripture to describe the bodily abode of the soul. The word greeting implies a joyful, rejoicing welcome. And therein is the danger. 
If you welcome it in, if you excuse the sin, it infects your soul. It takes up residence and it abides in you and you abide in it. You become its friend, joyfully welcoming its bondage, joyfully laying down your life for it, spending your time on it, all the while thinking it sounds right. But it isn't. What have you accepted that you know, that you know, Jesus would not accept? What have you turned a blind eye to that you know Jesus would have confronted? What abomination that causes desolation have you brought into the temple of the Holy Spirit? And with what have you partnered to become a conspirator with, fully deserving of the same punishment? Can you love Do you hate anyone? Anyone. You can hate sin. You're supposed to. But you're never called to hate the person. If you find that, you need to work on it. Hate the sin. God hates the sin because it destroys you. And there's Second John. I don't see why it takes Rob three years to finish a book. Now step it up. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for first loving us. We thank you for abiding in us. We thank you for your command that shows us who you are, that shows us your character. We thank you for showing us the ways of this world and and showing us a better way. We thank you, God, for your son, for the sacrifice that he made for us from the beginning, from before our definition of beginning. Because, Father, it's in you that all things are defined. We thank you, God. We thank you for, for who you are and for who you've called us to be, and we ask you to go with us today. We ask you to walk with us. We ask you to be there and give us the strength to walk in you as we abide in you. And so we just thank you, God. We thank you for, for each of this, each one in this family. We thank you for, for the family you brought us into, those that we don't even know yet. And we look forward to that eternity, that forever abiding in your word in the beginning and the last. And it's in your holy name and all your name that we, that we pray. Amen.